welcome back to 33 Founders. I'm so excited that you're with us today because I'm here with David Haber, the co-founder and CEO of Bond Street. Thanks so much for being with me today, David. So I'm super Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to get started because you're from San Diego too, where I am right now. So I actually want to rewind before we dive into Bond Street and see what taco catering chef David would think of CEO David. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. I grew up in, in San Diego and in, in Chula Vista and, um, you know, had always been fairly entrepreneurial as a kid and so had a ton of little businesses growing up. Basically, my parents said, you know, if you want gas money, you got to go figure out a way to make it. <laughs> and I started, you know, I spent one summer working at Target, you know, for minimum wage, essentially, and I realized, like, there has to be a better way to sort of... <laughs> figure out how to get spending money faster, right? And so, um, yeah, I started everything from, you know, uh, selling sort of curio gifts to, um, to Walgreens to, you know, I was on student council in, in uh, my high school and convincing them that I, that I should bring in a, a taco business to sell tacos at our Friday night football games. Um, and, you know, they were, none of them were like crazy successes, but I think what it, what it, showed me at a very young age was that you could make something from nothing. And once you realize that um, you can sort of, um, I think there's like a fun Steve Jobs quote that says like, you know, everything, everything around you is created by people like no more smarter than you. Uh, it was just a very empowering sort of realization. Um, I'm sure that there's like some common thread between that and, and building, you know, my current company. Well, tacos aside, Bond Street is really making a huge impact for small businesses. What you guys are doing is enabling small businesses to get loans between $50,000 and $500,000 in an average of a one-week process. Can you explain if I was a small business and I came to apply for a loan, what the process would be like? Absolutely. So, um, you know, traditionally today, uh, you couldn't apply for a loan online in any bank, right? So your process normally would be to walk into a branch, to print out your financials, to hand it over to a loan officer, and wait four to eight weeks. And you know what, the genesis really for starting the company was that we realized that there was all these really valuable data sources on the financial health of small businesses becoming accessible via API. So the product that we built, that, you know, that my partner Peyton and I built initially, was basically one that integrated with you know, products like QuickBooks, so you as the customer could log into your QuickBooks account and share your full financial history. You could give us your social and your EIN, and we'd written integrations into Experian and Equifax, so we could pull credit histories on the business as well as the owners. Um, you know, the IRS started accepting e-signature, so instead of physically having to sign a tax authorization form, you could e-sign it, and we could get back a digital feed of some of these tax filings. And then lastly, uh, the customer can log into their bank account and we can get their full sort of deposit history and transaction details. So in about you know, three to five minutes, basically, we, you know, the customer can share all the data we need to actually make a lending decision. No printing. And that really, no, yeah, no printing. Well, our, our sort of like product philosophy is that you should theoretically be able to fill out that application with any wallet. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't want you, um, even if it's more expensive for us, like to have to go to the IRS directly, I'd rather you not have to go search for the physical printout or even the digital file to have to upload online. I think one of the most telling things about your work, and you and I were just discussing it, is that after a business raises money with you guys, they pay back the loan, they've achieved what they need to achieve, now they're on to the next big thing they're very capable of going to a bank and getting financing, but they come back. What does that mean to you, especially only being two years in? Yeah, I mean, that's everything, right? I mean, ultimately, um, you know, our aspiration is for this business is to build, you know, build the best customer experience we possibly can, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, in some ways we're in the business of selling money, <laughs> and our dollars are just as green as, as Chase or as any other lender. And so for me, it's about really creating a customer experience that provides 
you know, so much, so much more value even beyond just the economics of the transaction. And so while we do compete on rate and on speed, um, that's sort of the lens by which we view, you know, the company. And so I sort of describe it as, you know, we really want to be their financial advocate even more than just the lender. And so I think you'll see us even over time continue to build technology and product to help our founders think about how to grow their businesses more successfully. And one of the things, as you mentioned, that we've been really pleasantly surprised by, um, you know, that we'd be working with um, companies that were very bankable, even at the outset, right? These are companies doing 10, 15 million, 20 million in revenue who have essentially any, every option available to them and yet are choosing to forego their existing bank relationship to come work with us um, because they really want that better customer experience. And so here in New York, a great example of that, you know, is, is a company called Joe, which is, you know, one of the larger sort of uh, like craft coffee franchises in the city. And we helped, you know, this is a business that's been around since 2003. You know, it does well over $10 million in revenue. And we helped open their 11th location next to Lincoln Center. And then they came back and we opened their 12th location next to NYU. And now we're talking about their 13th location. And that's just an amazing... Uh, amazing feeling to sort of continue to deepen our relationship with our customers. As you talk about the customer relationship, it really reminds me of something that Jerry, your chief credit offer, credit officer shared that, you know, business owners actually want to talk to you. You know, they, they want to get your opinion. They don't want it to be let's fax this back and forth and then eventually get a no or get a yes, but not really understand what you're getting into. Customer service is so important to you. What are some ways that you guys are really differentiating yourself in that arena? Yeah, for, for me, creating a great customer experience happens at every touch point, right, with the customer. And it, it comes down to, you know, the design of your site, the transparency of your rates and fees, the simplicity of the application and sharing that information, the way we talk to our customers, and even more importantly, the way we decline them, right? Because we can't, we won't, where that applies. Um, and so making sure that that, you know, customer experience is a good one at every point of that transaction is so important. Um, and today, I mean, something that I keep telling the team is like, our declines are still sending us their friends. And if that's happening, like, we're doing something right, right? Even if we had to say no, they're still spreading the word, which is a great, a really great feeling. Um, and, you know, as far as, like, technology is concerned, I mean, I think, um, you know, my view is there is, like, we need to continue to invest in technology and, and build efficiency so that we can afford the human touch, right? You know, we've already taken the process from, you know, four to eight weeks to, you know, in many cases, 48 hours. How do we get that even to four to eight seconds? And that, you know, it's not to say that, like, every customer wants an immediate decision because it is a pretty consistent considered transaction when they're borrowing a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, but being able to make a smart decision fast, you know, frees us up to have, you know, those human connections that I think are really important to a lot of people. And down the road, I know you guys are working to really help small businesses understand where they are in their market. What are you envisioning for that? Yeah, it's something we've been thinking a lot about, and we haven't launched product against it yet, but, um, you know, in, in many cases, our customers don't need money tomorrow, right? They're thinking about opening a new location a week, a month from now, two months from now, and so we, we think a lot about how do we build um, that, that relationship with our customer early into that decision-making process or provide value to them even before that transaction, and so, you know, we've written all these API integrations to collect data at the point of underwriting, but something we're thinking a lot about is, you know, how do we encourage people to come to the site, sync their accounts, and us provide, you know, some insight to them earlier on. So maybe it's, you know, how do your margins compare to your peers in your industry and in your geography? You know, here are three actionable steps you can take to, you know, improve the credit quality of your business. Um, it's something we're still refining, but um, I think there's such an opportunity to, again, sort of deepen the customer relationship, you know, up the funnel and even, even post-transaction, right? Like, I don't want the relationship to stop after we've made the loan. Like, it should be about helping you continue to grow the business. 
And because we maintain these persistent connections into their accounts, certainly that's helpful for us from like a risk management perspective to understand how the portfolio is doing. But even being able to use that, that data to sort of inform and anticipate their future financing needs is something we think a lot about. So how do we be proactive and actually offer them additional finances or, or insight and guidance before they have to ask? And I, I think that's, that's an experience that, um, you know, certainly no other online lender in this space, but definitely no bank, um, I think, has, has provided, um, you know, to small businesses. When you talk about that consideration and that genuine care for your customer, I think it really lends to the reason you guys have seen so much growth. You know, you guys have, is it 40% month over month right now? Or if that's an older article. Something around there, yeah. So, something yeah, around it's, there. It's definitely still growing quickly. Yeah. And you guys haven't really done very much marketing. It's really been word of mouth. That's right. So, yeah, it's, uh, so go ahead. Being only two years in, not even two years in, how, how do you feel? What are you most proud of? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm honestly most proud of the team that we built. Um, you know, we, when we started, we raised basically a million and a half dollars in, in equity, and we had a team of seven. <laughs> and we still, you know, by the way, we're only nine people today, so we're still pretty tiny. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we did a lot with very little. And, you know, we built an amazing product. Uh, we delighted our customers. You know, we raised, you know, more recently, you know, over $100 million in equity and debt capital. Um, and that, you know, it's not so much to like beat our own chest, but it's actually going to, like our biggest problem last year was not having enough lending capital. And so being able to, to now have the resources to really grow this thing and help, you know, thousands more companies across the country succeed is, is really what's exciting. And so something I'm thinking a lot about certainly now as we continue to grow the team is how do we sort of um, bring on the right folks to the company, you know, people that, you know, we believe are exceptional that sort of share this common passion and, you know, are passionate about this mission to, that we have to sort of, um, uh, yeah, change, you know, change what it means to, change what the relationship is for small businesses when they're thinking about raising, raising capital to grow. I know one of the results of your Series A is growing the team, as you mentioned, and I read that you guys are planning on growing from, I still can't believe you're nine, but from the nine that you are now to 40 or 50 team members in the next two years. When I read that, I was like, oh my God, that sounds like a lot of work. What's your, <laughs> what's your approach to that? It's tough. I mean, you kind of have to be relentless. <laughs> like, recruiting is, a, is definitely a full-time job. Um, it's also been about being restrained, right? I think we've been very um, uh, happy to see that, you know, really great, great people that have applied for, for roles of the company. Um, but also, there's, there's this tension, I think it's true, of, of most founders. Like, there's so much stuff to get done. And so there's an urgency and a need to just want to put, to throw people at the problem. But also, I think more importantly, being restrained because, you know, certainly the first 20, definitely the first 40, like, for for exiting the size of the business, the, the culture of the company is changing, you know, at every every multiple, and so um, we're trying to be very thoughtful about, um, you know, who we bring on. When you talk about culture, what does it feel like right now? So if I walked into, if I teleported myself to New York and I walked into the Bond Street office, what would I see? How would I feel? There's a lot going on. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're about excuse me, we're about to move. Uh, Offices, so we're currently like in a thousand square feet. With I think we're we have a couple of interns with us right now, so we're probably twelve people in the space. So there's a, a lot happening, and you've probably seen people walking behind me. Uh, uh, I think what the culture we built is one where um, it's incredibly collaborative. I think people approach every problem with a, a sense of curiosity and the fact that they don't know everything. And I think you know Peyton and I certainly realized that very early on, right? I knew I wanted to build a company with Peyton. He was, you know, incredibly talented technically. We were, we'd also been friends for five years uh, before starting the company together. Um, uh, but, you know, we knew early on that we were going to live and die by the quality of loans we made. And so, and neither of us came from a risk or credit background. And so it was really important for us to bring in somebody who had a ton of experience. And that's why early on we were spending so much time running up and down City and Amex and Chase talking to senior risk folks 
And we ended up getting in touch with Jerry, who, you know, was essentially the head of risk for small business lending at Citibank. I mean, he ran small business lending nationwide. Um, you know, we ended up pulling him out of the bank as our first hire, which is, if you think about it, it's a really funny conversation, right? You're asking the head of risk at a massive bank to join a two-person company when we're working out of our apartment. <laughs> like, uh, it's just a funny juxtaposition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, it's been one of the best decisions we've made. And, you know, I think initially we were sort of, you know, hesitant or questioning, like, you know, does he really understand what he's getting himself into? I mean, he's, he's 57. He's worked, you know, for 30 years at big banks. Like, we're really scrappy. You we, we don't have, like, this massive infrastructure. Um, but we sort of stuck to our gut and, and leaned on some of our advisors. And it's been one of the best decisions we've made. And so I think it's important, we always think about it, and especially in terms of hiring, it's like, who's the right person for this role? And, you know, sometimes that means like, you know, being a little audacious and pulling a super senior person out of you know, one of the biggest banks in the world. What were some of those first meetings like? From, from the outside, it sounded like he was pretty into it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, he, uh, I think he had seen the opportunity certainly from within the bank. And he had seen the, you know, the huge community of customers that they were declining, which he believed were still, you know, businesses that that should be supported. Certainly, um, I think he, you know, had been frustrated with sort of the bureaucracy and, and speed that you know probably any big company moves, but certainly the banks with with all the regulation that they have against him. I think he, in Peyton, saw someone who could help translate this sort of you know, technology enabled vision of how to make things much more efficient, how to build a better relationship with your customer. Um, and I think he saw the world changing, right? I think, you know, uh, I think, you know, consumers and business owners are coming, coming to expect to do their financial services online. Like they do everything else online. And, you know, the fact that you couldn't apply for a, line, a loan online at any bank and instead they had spent, hundreds of billions of dollars putting a bank branch on every street corner in America. <laughs> I think he just saw that sort of tide changing. Um, and we just really hit it off. Like, I think he, uh, you know, we recognize certainly we could learn a lot from him. And I think he believed that he could learn a lot from us, which I hope he has. And uh, yeah, it's been a great team. When it comes to leadership and your role as CEO, especially as the company has grown and you guys have hit big milestones, you shared that one of the lessons you learned during your time at Spark was to really have conviction in your decisions because if they were bullish on something, they were going to lead around in a company regardless of what other investors came in. They really focused on what they believed in. What role does that play in your role as a leader? Yeah, I think it's I think it's hugely important. I think it's important not only you know what we were sort of talking about our, our core company values, and one of them was plant the flag, <laughs> and that's sort of like a visual metaphor for like yeah, being bold, like take risk, don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, ultimately, like we need to we're not here to sort of build and create an incremental improvement to what exists. Like we're here to just sort of you know radically change like what that experience should feel like, you know, change the conversation around what a loan is even like, you know, it should it be viewed just as dead or sort of negatively or, or really as a tool to help accomplish something amazing. And so, um, you know, I think most importantly, like, um, I think good leaders help create an environment to, to enable people to do their best you know, to produce great work. Um, and so I, you know, I hope that that's what I'm continuing to do. I, you know, this is the first time I'm doing it, so I have a lot to figure out, but um, it's been really fun. I want to shift gears for a couple of minutes and talk about your recent Series A because you shared something previously that really stuck out to me. So we saw a ton of headlines about Bond Street, you know, 110 million, and it's a great number, really rolls off the tongue. But you said that... Yep. Nothing was easy about the funding round, and you don't take sure. it for granted. I really appreciate it that you said that. What was it like fundraising for you? And you've been in venture capital, so you already knew what it was like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
I think just starting a company in general has given me a tremendous amount of empathy you know, for, for founders. I mean, as, as successful as any business is, it's still incredibly, incredibly hard. Uh, I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's super challenging. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, fundraising is, is not fun. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, again, no matter how successful it's going. And I, I think for us, you know, we had sort of this dual challenge where we were not only raising equity capital, which is sort of what I was most familiar with, but, you know, raising significantly larger amounts of debt capital. And that's a little bit more complicated because, um, you know, any term in, in, the, in the contract essentially dictates your business model, who you can lend to, how much you can lend, at what rate, how much, what types of loans. And so um, navigating that, you know, having never done it before and as, a, as a pretty young company um, is challenging, especially when we kept seeing all these amazing businesses that we wanted to fund. And it was just really frustrating and we felt guilty that, you know, we, we want to approve you. We, we would love to fund the loan. Can you just hang out with us for like a month or two until we figure this out? And I think we only lost like one customer. I mean, it's just been amazing to sort of, um, you know, people I think appreciated that candidness and like transparency. Um, you know, they were trying to figure out just like we were, right? There's like a, a certain connection there of also being a small business, also fundraising, literally. Um, uh, so yeah, I, do, I definitely don't. I don't take it for granted, and um, I think we've been very fortunate to be able to surround the business not only with a great team, but with um, you know great investors who sort of share our passion for what we're building. And so it was fun, certainly for me, to come full circle and you know work with with the guys at Spark, who you know I had spent two and a half years working with and um, you know really admired, and then you know also to bring in some other you know, fun angel investors that I had gotten to know over, over my short career. You know, I, I sat next to Nathan for a summer, you know, my sophomore year, and he went out to go found Airbnb, and, you know, he came back and invested in the company. And it's just, it's just been really fun. It's, we feel super fortunate. One of my favorite parts learning about your efforts fundraising was when Hunter Walk said that Peyton and you sent your term sheet over for your seed round on Christmas Eve. Yeah, yeah. He sent he sent his term sheet to us on Christmas Eve, and oh, we signed on New Year's. New Year's Eve. Yeah, and we yeah we signed on New Year's. So it was sort of, um, yeah. There's like a fun symbolism there. It's like you know, we're, we're constantly hustling, <laughs> like even on national holidays, like uh, you know. And, and it's a testament to him too, actually. Like, you know, I think. Um, I think venture folks often get a bad rap for disappearing and going on vacation for all of August and kind of disconnecting during the holidays. And I think, um, you know, what he and Satya have done with Homebrew in a very short period of time is just pretty amazing. And part of that is like, yeah, working, hustling while everybody else is sort of relaxing. And, you know, the fact that he was willing to do that, you know, even on vacation with his family, it's just, uh, I think, speaks to his conviction around the business and um, they've been incredibly loyal um, investors to us. Yeah, I don't know him personally, but just from seeing him on Twitter, I've interviewed a couple of their portfolio companies and he is so active promoting his <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he and, and he and Satya make a great team. And Satya is actually on our board. Um, and I'd gotten to know Satya a little bit through B. Jayan, who... Um, you know, we Spark had been an early investor in Twitter, and, and Satya had been VP of product, so I had heard his name mm -hmm. through through Bijan, and, and then certainly I had friends at Google who had worked for Hunter at YouTube, um, so I knew them by reputation. Um, I really got introduced to them. I helped invest in a company called Plaid when I was at Spark, and um, my colleague Mo had led the deal and sits on the board, but they had invested a small amount, and so when I was thinking about sort of raising my initial seed. Um, Zach and Will, who are the co-founders of Platter, are like, these guys are unbelievable. Like, I wish I'd carved an even bigger part of the round for them. You should definitely go talk to them. Welcome. And yeah, and you know, they had this sort of thesis around the bottoms up economy and building, investing in companies that help support small businesses. Um, and it just, yeah, totally fit like squarely within, you know, what we wanted to do with Bond Street. 
love it. So David, I want to shift gears for the last couple of minutes and just talk about some life questions that don't have to do with Bond Street. What's one lesson that sure. you've learned the last 27 years that you can't imagine not knowing now? Man, um, how important it is to have uh, a partner like right before we started the business. And uh, my wife, Julie, has been an incredibly um, important investor, supporter of, of helping us through this process, right? Like having somebody that um, is there no matter what is just, um, yeah, pretty powerful. And like, you know, I don't think I would have expected to have been married by 25 <laughs> if you had asked me, you know, in college. Um, but uh, something I did, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty amazing. So knowing what that feels like is something that I never would have, uh, I could never have imagined, like, you know, in the past 25 years. I just got, it's funny you bring that up because I was just getting a lecture on work-life balance for my dad. And everyone lately, it seems odd, has been mentioning, like, no, you have to have balance. You are not your business. Like, you have to do things outside of work. So how do you, as difficult as it is, turn off Bond Street and just you and Julia, you go hang out, you have a weekend that's not totally dedicated to work? It's really hard. <laughs> and it's something that I don't think we perfected candidly. Um, you know, she's certainly been incredibly patient, like as we've run around and tried building this thing. Um, one thing we are trying to do is like create more routine. And actually, it was a question that I had asked Nathan when I was hanging out with him at, at Airbnb a few weeks ago. And, you know, I saw him go from, you know, it was his first job at a college when we were working together to, you know, now running a company that has, I don't know, like 2,000 employees worldwide. So, you know, I'm like, how, how have you done this? He just had, his, he and his wife just had a baby. Like, I'm like, you know, how have you personally scale it? Yeah. Especially when yeah, there's a yeah, kid Yeah, it's like, how, how, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. And, you know, I, it was just a question. I was like, how, how have your, how's your relationship scaled? How have you made time for each other? And yeah, his advice was like, you know, putting things on the calendar, like creating a habit, you know, planning ahead, uh, you know, putting a trip in the distance. So, you know, we did, my wife and I recently uh, went to Wyoming <laughs> and, and, you know, my whole goal for it was like, let's go somewhere where we can just totally disconnect. And so, you know, we went to the least populated state in America <laughs> Uh, and it was amazing. It was just so beautiful. And I think it's, um, it, it, you know, I just, it's easy to sort of get in the habit of like grinding, you know, and like going day to day, just heads down doing your work. But um, I actually think it, uh, it was totally refreshing. And I think it brought like a totally different energy back when I, when I came back from the vacation, both to our relationship and to the business. So um, I need to, start doing that more <laughs> on that note of having those types of realizations i'm not a huge fan of the what advice would you give your 16 year old self question because you were doing good you were selling tacos like you were set you don't can't you can't give david who was 16 advice what do you want to remember when you're 35 about life right now um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, something that I've learned, and I think it's true, like, I don't think, there's a lot that I didn't appreciate when I was 16, for sure, right? When you're 16, life was fairly linear, right? It's like, okay, here are all the classes you need to take. Okay, do well in those classes. Try to get into a good school. Okay, you know the pecking order of schools. Okay, try to get as good as you can. Um, and then you get to college, and it's like, okay, you can do whatever you want. You can study whatever you want. You can... You know, and, then, and then life is even more amorphous. Like you can literally go do whatever you want. And um, I think not being afraid to sort of follow your own path and not doing sort of what everything, everybody else was doing. It was definitely a culture at Harvard of like going into finance and consulting. And I didn't even know what an investment bank was coming from, you know, Chula Vista growing up. And, um, you know, there was like a very critical decision that I made when I first graduated with, you know, to go work for this guy named Rory who had been this incredible entrepreneur. And there was a funny tension between like something really amazing and attractive about 
you know, the potential of making more money than your parents in your first job out of college. I mean, that is just a crazy, a crazy thing to think about. But foregoing, you know, going into investment banking and working for somebody who, you know, taking a significant salary cut, but working with him day to day, right? Like, and that's just paid huge dividends. I mean, you know, uh, he became an incredibly close mentor of mine. I think it showed you that the world was much bigger than Wall Street or, or whatever, whatever the flavor of the month is. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, just being willing to embrace sort of the uncharted path, you know, taking risk, uh, being vulnerable, I think it's just super important. Um, and so hopefully, like, hopefully this becomes, you know, a, a successful business, but, um, you know, constantly sort of putting yourself in, in new situations and, and um, yeah, thinking about what, what is ultimately going to make you happy versus whatever everybody else is doing. I loved one of the insights that you shared about your time with him is that it taught you just by observing him that, you know, success doesn't dictate being humble. It doesn't dictate working hard. It doesn't dictate trying new things. And it's amazing to see how now he's an investor in Bond Street and you're still working with him. Yeah. I mean, that, that if there's anything he taught me, and he taught me a lot, like it is what, um, what a good model of success should look like. I mean, he had been incredibly successful, like one of the most successful entrepreneurs that I've ever met. Um, and yet he was one of the most humble and inclusive and generous people. And so having that as like your first boss and like kind of profile for what should that should, because I think, you know, in finance, in tech, like there's a lot of people who are, are fairly arrogant and like, you know, they have some success. And I think, I think success really just sort of puts a magnifier on whatever is there. Um, and he was just a great example of somebody like if you're good at your core, like even if you've made, you know, a crazy, crazy amount of money, like you can still be an amazing person. Um, yeah, and it's just, uh, it's been great to sort of continue to build that relationship with him and, and have him, you know, continue to be supportive and encourage me to sort of go off and build something. I love it. All right. Last question. What's one question that you've always wanted to be asked, but nobody's ever asked you? And it doesn't have to be a serious oh, man. one. It could be like, what's your favorite karaoke song? could be anything. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. Uh, why don't you like chocolate? What? <laughs> uh, yeah. Please exactly. tell me you're lying. Yeah, I'm like my whole family are chocoholics, and ever since I was like a baby, I never. Yeah, I never, I never liked chocolate. It's like the weirdest, the weirdest thing ever. Oh my god, uh, <laughs> I'm getting attention headache. So. How? Long <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll mail you a Hershey bar. Oh, bad, bad question to end the interview. We're gonna end on another note. Let's fast forward. It's 2020. And, oh, God, we're going to be so old. But nonetheless, it's 2020. There is a huge cover story coming out about Bond Street. What do you want the headline to be and what or who is in the picture? Oh, man. Um, I mean, I hope, it's, uh, I hope it's something to the effect of, like, you know, Bond Street has had a huge impact on the economy and has helped, you know, thousands of small companies continue to grow and you know, I mean, that's like the, like, we, we are only going to be successful if we help other people be successful. And so visually, it'd be awesome to have like a bunch of our like, you know, early, early customers who continue to grow with us Emma there Shine. in the frame. Yeah, Emmett Shine or Jonathan Rubenstein from Joe or Back Britain, like any of these folks. Um, yeah, that would be awesome. Right. And like, maybe it's our team in the middle or something. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think that would be, that would be super powerful. David, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. Before we go, can you let everyone know how they can start using Bond Street and stay up to date with everything you guys are working on? Absolutely. So we, we just updated our site. We're, we are now bondstreet.com. So you can go just directly to bondstreet.com and uh, learn more about the business. And also, if you are a small business owner or entrepreneur, you know, you can fill out an application and 
as we talked about, we typically get back to folks within you know just a couple of days. So, and then on check Twitter, it out. you guys are on Bond Street, right? We are, yeah. It's it's on Bond Street, um, and you can also at mention me if you want. And it's just D Haber, D H A B E R. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.